Hello folks and welcome to our game with myself Shane Stevenson joined as ever by Michael Verney talking all things GA here as ever we do. Huge amount of uh, GA matches on over the weekend. Just to run through the, the fixtures in Division 1, Galway beat Mana and you were at that Michael. Tyrone came from behind to beat Kerry, Roscommon, they came up a little bit short at home to Mayo and Armagh and Donegal, that was a three point win for, um, for the Orchard County as well. So plenty of really tight games on over the weekend. Is it the most unpredictable league or the most open league, maybe potentially leading into the most open championship we've had in Manny's year, I'd say? Like, it's very hard to get a read on teams, isn't it? Like, it's very hard to make uh, competent judgments on a team one week and then you just like, almost think it's ripped up the next week. It's very, it's very hard to get a proper read on teams. And listen, maybe that's more interesting than if we were seeing a consistent graph the whole way along. Like Tyrone, for example, which we get into... Uh, later, like it's just amazing. Like they, the All Ireland champions come to town and they produce a performance on a completely different level to anything they've produced so far yet this year. Um, it's amazing, really, and it's, it's so unpredictable. And like potentially six points potentially might not keep you safe in Division One because everybody's beating each other. And um, we were just saying at the Porridge Ice yesterday, like they are, like I would say Galway are as good as safe. I would mm. say, but. You know, or you know, you think they're f- fairly safe, but they're not really. You know, technically, and um, like even Ross Common after winning three games at the start of the campaign are technically not safe either. So, like you're talking about no jeopardy in really Division One hurling, and there's jeopardy everywhere you look in Division One football, and all the, obviously all the other tiers as well. Yeah, so Mayo they're top with eight points. Then Ross Common and Galway have six. Armagh five. Then Kerry, Tyrone and Monaghan are on four with Donegal on three. And, you know, interesting that Tyrone, who were the bottom team, or, yeah, they were the bottom team coming into the weekend, they beat the All-Ireland champions, Kerry. Donegal, who have only one yeah. win the whole time, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. they beat Kerry. So everyone's taking it out on Kerry at the moment. But, uh, well, Richard Hogan says, no mop chop for Vernie. Yeah, I wasn't thinking that you'd get it in over the weekend. No, it would be a big job. In fairness, actually, I walked past the... The, the barbers in Dunboyne the other day and uh, your one saw me out through the window and she was kind of looking at me like that. It was around four o'clock on the Saturday and she was thinking, the last thing I want is this lad walking in. But thankfully enough, I, I, I trotted on, went down and got a coffee. But you know when you can see that someone does not want to see you? And I'd say she was a relieved woman that I walked past that door. She'd want a weed whacker, I'd say, to go at that joke there. Uh, Joe Butler says, Hi, guys. Watching a lot of Gaelic football over the weekend. Did you ever see the amount of pulling and dragging in a game? It's hard to know what constitutes a foul nowadays. Well, I suppose one of the things that's uh, coming up into the conversation or into the limelight again is bits of simulation. We're seeing it in both hurling and Gaelic football, so we're not picking out one code over the other. There was that incident that included Sean Kelly, excellent player for Galway. Really like watching him and always has a great attitude, but he, he went down very, very handy. Uh, players constantly going into contact, putting the arms up in the air, looking for freeze. I thought Jerry O'Burns got, uh, you know, you know, towards the very end of the game when he did eventually get a free, but he went into contact when he was soloing into the Donegal part or um, defence. He came in, and as soon as anyone came near him, the arm went up in the air. And I just think referees need to not buy this stuff because it's just happening across the board a little bit. Um, I kind of agree with Joe there. I think. Um... I have to say, I think hurling referees have gotten a lot better at not buying frees because I think it's uh, with the hurling, the arm almost it, it maybe it's more obvious uh, when they're trying to buy it or whatever. But I was even watching um, Dublin and Derry the other night, and a couple of times, you know, I, was, I saw Kieran Kieran Kilkenny go like that a couple of times to in reference to one of the Derry players. I think Khan did something similar as well. Um, it's definitely becoming far more prevalent than you would want, and they're going to have to they're going to have to get to the stage where they start potentially dishing out cards uh, or punishing players that they feel have gone down, you know, incorrectly or puni- punishing players somewhat as well. Like, should it be like imagine like they start blowing a free against you when you're trying to buy a free, we'll say, and hurling, or you stop a lot of lads stop as well, put their arms in the air and stop, and all of a sudden free the other way. And then, you know, they won't be long stopping doing it. But that, that that's one thing, the, the simulation thing of, you know, getting, you know, a tiny little knock to your chest or tiny, not even, you you know, running into somebody. And all of a sudden, somehow you run into somebody um, chest to chest and you end up going down holding your face. Do you know what I mean? Like this, like that's, that has no place in any games. Um, and one of the reasons I 
fell out of love with soccer would have been a lot of that, I'd say, to be honest with you, because I just couldn't buy, I just I couldn't watch that anymore. He basically, remember, was it recently, um, I think it was Roy Keane and Micka Richards were praising Jack Grealish for winning a penalty when he clearly dived. They were actually both praising him, and I was just flabbergasted by it, that that was the level of punditry that was going on as well. And the, there's cuteness, and there's you know, just blatantly breaking the rules or blatantly doing something that is not sportsmanlike at all and uh, yeah I wouldn't be a big fan of it and I think they need to stamp it out ASAP mm, I wonder has there ever been a more petulant display in sport than what uh, Bruno Fernandes showed yesterday for Man United he just started sulking looked like he wanted to come off did did the whole diving simulation going down holding his face when he was barely touched but I think you want uh, Luke Shaw was also awful but yeah I just I, no it's just Every time someone says the word petulant, I just think back of Dunphy with Ronaldo when it was Ronaldo against Messi in some Champions League game. You know, it was a display of petulance. You know, he just, <laughs> you know, he just called him a brat and a cod and all that carry on. Uh, but anytime anyone says petulance, that's immediately the first uh, word that comes to mind. I didn't see any of the soccer, I won't lie, but my WhatsApp groups were absolutely hopping with all different stuff. Like when it was 3-0, it was bad. When it was 4-0, it was bad. But when it ended up 7-0, it was boys absolutely going to town on United supporters. So I'd be one of, I would be a very casual, like Liverpool supporter, like legacy wise, but I, I don't have, you know, and I went and kind of, kind of tagged along with a few boys for the Champions League final in 2018 but I wouldn't be following how they're going or anything like that I wouldn't have any interest really but uh, it was just funny I was in a, in a WhatsApp group and there's United boys going absolutely bonkers and there's Liverpool boys going bonkers but I was just thinking like United by all accounts are going really well this season like really well like completely turned the screw Liverpool are going stinking off there's no point in saying any difference before, before yesterday anyway and it kind of got me thinking you know where does this rank in, like, you know, hammerings? Like, there's one thing, a team being hammered, but when you think, like, United are probably 50-50 going into that game, were they? It's probably 50-50, mm -hmm. realistically, who was going to win? I thought maybe, win, yeah. Yeah, maybe even skewed in United's favour because of their recent form. Then got me thinking, you know, what are the GA hammerings like that? In big games where you're thinking, an all Ireland final or semi-final, where you're thinking, can't call this game and somebody wins by 20 points. Um, well, Cork getting hammered by Limerick a couple of years ago. I don't think anyone saw a 16 point defeat coming that day, did they? I mean, I was even thinking oh, Cork no. would win the game. Yeah, yeah, that was a hammer. You're a bit of an ape, to be fair. Yeah, there is that. <laughs> um, I didn't see Tipperary losing by 18 points back in 2012 against Kikenny. I wasn't feeling too confident, but I didn't think that would happen, especially when you're winning at half time. Yeah, um, you definitely wouldn't have. No, like, that was bizarre, really. That was the whole yeah. Larry Tommy game, and of course, the whole defeat is blamed on Larry Corbett as a result of that, even though yeah, they were winning um, at half time. Tipperary paddling Kilkenny and every other All-Ireland uh, recently, I suppose there's that. Uh, <laughs> but 19, just on that, 2019, albeit Kilkenny going down a man, like that was a fair hammering. Mm. Like that was an almighty hammer in All-Ireland final. And, and Kilkenny had started the game okay. They'd actually started okay. They'd started the better of the two teams, to be honest with you. I remember there was a few clever, I would say, Tactical fouls that Tipperary made when Kilkenny had broken the line Sorry, a couple Heffern. times. Yeah, in particular. And uh, what did that end? Was that 325 to 20 points that day? Was that is that the same? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I think it was. I give day, up yeah. counting. <laughs> but uh, that, that was a fair hammer. Uh, remember, Mead gave Kerry an awful scutcheon in All Ireland semi final. Kerry were held to five points. Was it 01? I think it was 214. To five points like you just you wouldn't have you wouldn't have seen that coming in a million years from an Offaly point of view as well Offaly had beaten Cork in 2000 the Ren not Ireland champions and you know we took a fair paddling for Kilkenny in the final there's not quite any different and it was over quite early I think it was 515 to 114 or something along those lines but any other big games that ended in hammerings that were unlikely you'd love to hear love to hear from our viewers there must be there must be a few more big ones yeah, get your comments in. Porter Porter says, what did Tip win by in 16? Nine points. Nine. Yeah, was that the 229 to 220, I think, wasn't it? Something like that, yeah. yeah. It was, um, again, I gave up counting. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a few bits of news anyway. Uh, Tipperary ladies football star Ashley Maloney, she could be on her way to Australia. Uh, so apparently approached, approached by several clubs, including Geelong and Brisbane. Uh, Kyle Hayes, he's been handed a one-match ban for the off-the-ball incident against Galway last weekend. They're currently on a training camp in Portugal. Outside of 
Limerick, have you heard of any other team being on training camps at the moment? There probably is one or two, or at least gone away for weekends to Carton House, Johnstown House, or whatever. Yeah, I think Tip were on one the weekend just gone, but I think it was like local. It could have been somewhere in Kerry or something like that, I think. Um, it's a f- I remember like when COVID hit as well, Tipperary were in the middle of a training camp, weren't they? Um, they were somewhere abroad at the time, and I think Limerick had planned one, but Tipperary came back, and I think they all had to. Did they all have to um, isolate for like 14 days or something when they came something back like or that, something? Yeah. yeah, like it's bonkers, really. Um, like, listen, Hayes' suspension, the only the only ramifications that it has, it has nothing really on the league. The only ramifications it has is that potentially if he were to get sent off at some stage in Munster in an all learn semi-final, that he could, uh, he could end up missing a couple more championship games. There was talk that this could be a two-game suspension, but it's only a one game. They're playing Westmead this weekend. Um... Like that, with due respect, they'll win that game without him and probably without a couple more. And it's funny, Limerick are in a position where they're going to be in the knockout stages, probably of Division One at this stage. And you kind of wonder, do they want to be in a way? Or and well, it's one thing get to a semi final, but would they want to be in a final? Um, just a just a bit of an interesting one there because it is a bit of a poison chalice given the proximity to the Munster Championship now. Yeah, remember 2010, Tipperary were supposed to go away on a training camp, but there was the ash cloud eruption. So that stopped, halted flights in Europe at the time. That's Do right, that? yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm actually yeah. looking at the name of it here, and I'm trying to, I'm going to try and pronounce it. Aisha Fiala Yukel. Jeez, that's some, that's a fair old tongue twister, but there you go. Good, good 2008, to Kenny <laughs> Watford, Porter Porter says in terms of GA Hammerns. Nobody oh, yeah. saw that coming. Yeah, you know, like for an All Ireland final as well. Sure, what was it, three thirty to one eleven or something like that? And it was a real soft consolation goal that Waterford got at the end. I think, like in yeah, and that's kind of like the the Cork Limerick game game a couple of years ago in the All Ireland final. Just when you're expecting, not that it's fifty fifty, but sixty forty, sixty five thirty five, and then one team just absolutely obliterates the other. Yeah, well, and what do you make of uh, former club footballer of the year Eugene Brannigan being part of the Down squad this weekend? Like previously, he said he had no intention of being involved with Down. I'm sure Connor Fogart, or sorry, Connor um, Laverty being over the the county team is you know a huge part of that. And previously, there weren't that many Kilku players in there. Now there's about seven or eight. I've even heard maybe Sheelan Johnson is in there. Um, I've also heard talk that you know the Jim McGuinness being in training wasn't a once off only, but like you know without official confirmation it's hard to say that for sure but um yeah i'm not that surprised i'm not that surprised are you um there there is a lot there's like imagine the loyalty they would have to conor laverty um if we take loyalty out for a second as well imagine probably the belief that they would have in what he's doing or the levels he's going to get down football up to now i know they were beaten at the weekend um and they're probably out of the promotion race now realistically i think that division three looks like a three horse race now which Cavan Westmead and Fermanagh, who have probably been a bit of a surprise packet. Uh, but it doesn't surprise me that much. Like, there is a loyalty to lads. Now, Kilku could suffer as a result of that because guys who were focusing on club duty only and raising standards at club level are going in playing county now. They're pulling away from the club and they've got obviously got a new manager in as well, in Kilku as well, kind of Gilligan stepped aside. So, the club might suffer as a result of that, but there is a sense of loyalty definitely to your own club man that when he goes in and down, you don't want to see the ship sinking. You want to do whatever you can if you're good enough to drive things on, I suppose. John Collins is talking about the hammerings again. He said, uh, show my age here, but in 82, Cork hammered Waterford 531-39 to and then lost the All-Ireland final to Kilkenny by 10 points. I was devastated. The glorious uncertainty of sport. It's very true. It's uh, unreal, yeah. Could be a major blow for the Wexford Herders, but a finger injury has ruled out Liam Ryan from their last two league games. So he dislocated his finger in the open league defeat to Galway, and he's had to have a little bit of surgery as well on ligament damage to the middle uh, finger on his right hand. So that's not ideal. It's it's funny, like people would think, oh, just wrap up your finger and, you know, hurl away. It's really not like that, especially if you're going to have to catch the ball with it or if you're, you know, grabbing a jersey. I mean, it's a physical game. This does happen. You do grab onto an opponent. And the pain that can come from it, you, like it's very difficult to hurl with that. Yeah, uh, very, even with football now as well. I remember Ian Maguire had a hand injury last year. And even when you're trying to just grab someone back for a second or something like that, you can just, like the damage you can do, like if you don't get a slap on it, you don't get a belt on it, you might be okay for a while. But then if something aggravates it, you're in big trouble. I broke my index finger on my right hand before and I broke it down at the very 
uh, just joining the knuckle to the finger. And it just, you'd know, like it was unbelievably painful, out, outrageously painful. If, you, if it's maybe your little finger, you might get away with it. But saying that, if it's your little finger on your right hand uh, and, and your grip on your hurl is not the same and your hand is slipping off when you're mm. striking, it has all, it's a, listen, for a forward, I'd say um, it's probably a lot more difficult to manage. Maybe the, a corner back or something that's only picking a few balls and hand passing the ball out and spoiling the lad, maybe it's not not as bad. Just say you're a free taker and you're carrying a hand injury. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like or something like that. Very, like very, very difficult to survive. Yeah, I've had this sort of mallet pinky finger for a long time. I can't bend that down really at all. I'm sure plenty of other lads who've played are like that. And for a while, I think I think it's like the ligament or something like that basically is gone in it. Something like that. Um, no one no one would understand like if you tried to explain this to somebody outside of Ireland or whatever that like look if you just say if you put 30 hurlers into a room and you say this is an amateur sport here's their hands from playing and they're like you know do you ever see George O'Connor Wexford his outrageous, hands outrageous yeah outrageous oh. like it's mad like but like, I don't know there's something like it, it's just like a, would right passage be the right way of saying it it's just like if you play a hurling this is what's probably going to happen in your hands. Football did a lot of damage to mine. Um, in, when an, if an O'Neill sits the top of the finger, the top third of the finger pushes it back, and then you just it, you don't have the same flexibility in it. For I'm only getting mine back now, but like I always said, you put your fingers together and you see the gaps. You see the gaps yeah. that are in between your fingers. It's not good. As long as you're able to. At least we're able to type or whatever and do a bit of work and stuff. But yeah, I think it's just taken as given that you're going to have problems with your fingers if you play it hard. Yeah, but like for a long time, that one was just sore um, and I couldn't really play. I kept trying to wrap it up with different tape. It was only when I found that sort of elastic -y tape, you know, the way, like you can have tape for your hands or whatever, but there's a sort of an elastic one that you can sort of almost mold around your finger a little bit. It gave it that little bit of cushion and I thought it was very good. So if anyone out there is watching and they know the name of that stuff, let us know because it is. Yeah, because I know your. Uh, I got a thing, um, Evo Shield, that was called around my my thumb at one stage, and I know your brother Paddy had something similar. He broke his ribs before, didn't mm. he? Yeah, and he had an Evo Shield thing around, a guard around. But it's funny when you can find things that work, and just you could be in agony with that, and it could be really problematic. And you just find something that just works, or and you're able to get, you're able to still have the flexibility and still uh, use it, but you're in an awful lot less pain. And you find some KT tape, it could well be, yeah. Is that, is that what it's called? Okay, okay. Um, okay, St. Connellet's Park in Newbridge is closed for up to 18 months from the end of March to allow for a 17.5 million euro redevelopment, Kildare GA is confirmed. Jesus Christ, 17.5 million doesn't get you quite that much these days, is it? I, I was flabbergasted when I saw the, the number involved here. Um, I think it's only going to be, well, only going to be, it'll be 15,000 the capacity uh, by the time they're finished. God, I don't know, you'd have to wonder about, it's 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 mad because I followed the race and obviously, and you have over 100 million, I think, was pumped into the nearby Curra race course, which was, you know, an unbelievable, uh, had unbelievable uh let's say, culture and history maybe before the start of the development. And development went on so long that it almost kind of sucked the life out of place and they're struggling to get that atmosphere kind of back in that. They lost a lot of patrons who would have just landed on the whole time to all the different events. And Kildare's, uh, Connors Park's going to be closed for a good while now. But you just wonder, I don't know, you just wonder what, what banger they're going to get for their book. Yeah, they're going to have a, a nice ground that can hold, whatever we say, 15,000. But are they going to get that many... Neutral games, um, are yeah, are they really going to get banged for their book? Seems like an awful wedge of money to be putting in. Yeah, one thing that they'll definitely need is a team that's competing a little bit better than what they are at the moment. But we'll come to that in a while. Speaking of teams not competing that well, Waterford, their county board chairman Michael O'Regan says that a review of Waterford football will be carried out in the coming months. He was saying on WLR, um, their no, Lorna Parker show. He said, "I've been talking with Effie Fitzgerald, who's the manager, myself on that." I've uh, reached out to a couple of individuals who are going to come back to me as regards leading up a football review. It'll probably involve ex-players, officers of both the adult board and board and all ex-managers, teachers that are doing football within primary and secondary schools, development squads and club officers. There'll be discussions with regards to where we are with football and what we want to achieve. Would it be fair to say that there's a lot of people in Waterford that couldn't care less? There, like there probably is, and there's definitely some diehard football people who do, but... Uh, like there's probably a reason that they're down in Division Four and that players aren't lining out for them. Yeah, uh, you know, 
really struggling to get players the last couple of years. It's mad to think that Desi Hutchinson played a you know a season or the latter stages of a season football before he went back playing hurling. But yeah, they're just really struggling to get. Uh, they're really struggling to get the best players involved. Um, there seems to be a general kind of apathy towards football in the county now. They're sitting bottom of Division 4. They've no points from five games. They haven't really looked like getting any points from those five games. Um, it's a, it is a very difficult one for Eva Fitzgerald to be in that sort of position. Like, like what's what success this year? Like, for yeah. Watford? Like, what, like, you know, what's the end game if you get involved? I, I don't know. I don't know, Shane. I think you're, uh, Jesus, just survive. Like, is it just getting to the end of the year? And that's not being disrespectful. But at this stage, is it just getting to the end of the year, whenever that is? And you know, like, I, I find it interesting when there are counties out there who commit fully to Gaelic football, and Gaelic football is their main code, and still they're at the bottom of, you know, the lower divisions, or they're they're getting very few results, and you just wonder. So what's the end game for those counties in terms of like what they want to do in the next 5, 10, 15 years? And I, I think ultimately there are going to be a couple of counties out there who say, do you know what, let's just focus on enjoying club football uh, rather than pumping huge money into inter-county football where we're just getting hammered, we're not going anywhere, let's just make our clubs really strong. I think that's ultimately going to happen in time. Yeah, I remember chatting to Johnny Pilkington uh, for a piece a couple of years ago when Offaly were going particularly bad. And he kind of said, like, would we just be as 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 good to train two or three times with the county and let a lot of lads play for their clubs and whatever and have a, a vibrant club game and not be getting too fixated on the county game? Like, are we going to, how are we going to kind of, it's funny, like, Johnny's obviously involved with the 20s now and it's, I'm sure his opinion would probably be different on it now. But it's just like, what are the, you know, we're gone down that far. Um, What work are we going to have to do to get back up to, you know, where we'd like to be, is it even viable? Is it possible? Um but when you see like Jesus the when you see like if you know if a full strength Kerry played a full strength Watford, like what are you what are you talking like? Like what are you talking like would Watford would Watford score five times in the game? Are they likely to concede forty scores as well? Like just the the difference from bottom to top is just it's multiplied even in recent years. As it is in Hurling, but like for the most part, the teams that are weaker in Hurling, it's not their first sport. So mm. like they're probably treating it. Uh, Red Lad uh, says each county should be striving to have the best football and Hurling teams that they can have. Can't understand the snobbery. Uh, I'm just going to quickly go through a couple of the results in Camogie. So Cork 114, Tipperary 112, Kilkenny 17 points, Dublin 11 and Galway 114. Player 13. So that's the top division results there. In the um, the All Ireland post primary Croke, well, the Croke Cup uh, semi finals, St. Kieran's, they beat Cashel Community School 313 to 29. So that was comprehensive in the end. Aaron Nyland, uh, brother of Evan, he scored nine points for Presentation College, Athen Rai, as they beat Thurless 15 14. So that's two one point defeats for Thurless in recent times, having lost the, the Hearty Cup final both as well. Tip, both tip teams beaten in the semi final as well. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, I, I thought when, when Offaly Schools beat Cairns, if, the, if it was to tip somebody to win the All-Ireland, I think it did at the time, it would be Cairns. And I think Harry Shine was back the other day and looked really good again. Uh, he's had awful trouble with his hamstrings. Um, he would have played very little since the game against Galway where he went off in that Leinster semi-final, I'm going to say it was. He went off with a bad hamstring tear. played very, very little since. But he was playing the other day. Um and was massive for Cairns. And uh, yeah, I think Prez and Roy, I don't think they've won one. I think they were beaten in three finals, I'm going to say. And obviously Cairns have more on Ireland than, than most of us have had hot dinners. But uh, that'll be an interesting final. 